Hey guys, <laughs> Dr. Ken Nordberg, I'm still alive. <laughs> that, that virus hasn't caught me yet, so I've been really careful. Hope you've been careful too. But I uh, thought we'd do this outside today in my yard. And uh, uh, it was only 9 degrees above freezing this morning at 6 o'clock. Good old Minnesota. Nice spring weather, eh? <laughs> well, I've been anxious to talk and get on with my nitty gritty uh, seminars on whitetail hunting. And uh, this time we'll talk about a subject I've talked about before, but I want to spend more time on it. Uh, before I was kind of wanting to introduce these things and keep moving right along, not get too deep into the subject. But I think it's important to get deep into this subject to understand what this one is all about. And this subject is <laughs> ground scrapes and antler rubs. Yeah, everybody knows all about ground scrapes and antler rubs. There's nothing more to know about them. The only thing is that most people, what they know isn't right. It's not right at all. And it makes a lot of difference in your hunting, especially the early season when you're hunting ground scrapes. Uh, people, and then later, you know, uh, November, a lot of guys spend all their money and all their time at ground scrapes during the firearm hunting seasons. When it's too late for that, you know, you have to be really lucky to be at a ground scrape at that time that a buck is going to return to during that period. But there is, but it does happen. And what, but you can know when it's going to happen. Yeah, the signs that are there, that go with that particular kind of a scrape are there in the woods to tell you this is one of those kind of scrapes. Now I've taken quite a few really nice bucks, big dominant bucks, at ground scrapes in November, but I haven't found many ground scrapes in November where it'll work. But it usually works very good and soon. <laughs> One time I had to wait four hours for the buck to show up. Uh, another time the buck was there in 15 minutes. I couldn't believe it. It was so great. Well, anyway, we're going to start with antler rubs. And uh, antler rubs are, are more than some bark rubbed off a tree. You know, I've got a number of antler rubs here. These go back quite a few years. I used them in previous seminars around the country. Even down in the land of Georgia, I brought these things down there and so talk about them. But anyway, uh, an antler rub is more than just a, a, a trunk of a tree that the, the buck has rubbed the bark off. Uh, it, it, you know, interesting, you know. One of the th first things that a uh, rub like this tells you that, uh, in this case, let's see, it's uh, two inches in diameter. A two and a half year old buck is living in this area where this antler rub was made. That's the first thing I tell you. But there's a lot more to this than, than meets the eye. So let's talk about rubs a little bit. You know, first of all, you know it takes a buck quite a while to create a rub like that. You know, they, a lot of it is done with tips of their antlers, you know. It's, you, know, you people talk about it and you see these ivory tip antlers on bucks. Well, it can, they get to be ivory tip because they use those tips to rub bark off of trees. And uh, but a lot of it is done too in in the area close to their heads, where the antlers are typically all the knobs full of little sharp little points, you know, around the brow tines and down in that area, and they can gouge that take a lot of bark off of it pretty soon during that period. Now, th another thing about antler rubs, uh, you know, you see these little shredded pieces of bark here around the edges of this thing here, they're hanging there. Uh, when you're out in the woods and you find one, I always touch the thing, Is it, you know, does it feel damp? Are these little shredded pieces damp? If they're damp, it was made not too long ago. If, if they're dry, it was made quite a while ago. Well, a damp rub means that the buck that made this thing lives in this area, and he could be near right now, but it's dry like that. That buck, this two and a half year buck, 
during the firearm hunting season probably isn't even here. He's probably a mile away and he's hiding in a little place about an acre or two in size until breeding is over. And you can sit around and rub like this all during the firearm hunting season. Never see a buck, not even the buck that made this antler rub. Now that's something interesting to know. But antler rubs are made in three phases. There's three phases of antler rubs. The first one is made during the, uh, at about the first September, the last few days of August, first days of September, when bucks uh, rub velvet from their antlers. And I've said this before, you know, it's not a happy time for bucks. Uh, sometime, uh, some weeks before, a couple of weeks before this particular time, the blood flow Shut, was shut off. It just automatically happened. It's like somebody turned the bell and no more blood goes to the velvet. And the velvet, you know, is, where, is what forms antlers on a buck. All the development occurs from uh, this tissue over, over the velvet, over the, the antlers. And they start out small and they get bigger and bigger and puffier looking and puffier looking until the antlers are fully calcified. They're hard now. Yeah, like they are when we uh, in November when we hunt them in November, and uh, when that happens, that velvet gets to be really easily injured. You know, they can be walking through the woods and walk by a, a branch, and the branch could scrape across that velvet at this point, that little one two week period of time, and strip it open. It it busts it open. Now. The blood flow isn't there anymore, and uh, which means that tissue underneath the outer velvet, it feels like velvet, uh, that, that tissue underneath is rotting. Velvet is full of nerve tissues, and probably on purpose because they don't want anything to injure the velvet. And they, they feel something touching the velvet, they'll, they'll turn away from it really quickly. They don't want anything to injure that because if they injure the velvet, the, the development in that area of the antler will will be very poor, if at all, and they'll be at a disadvantage when when fighting with other bucks to gain dominance later on. So uh, they don't want that to happen. So at this point, uh, that tissue is rotting and it stinks, and it's attracting flies that like to that like rotten meat, you know, and there's a lot of those that form the maggots, you know, and rotten meat, and, uh, and, and hornets, and yellow jackets, you know, they're a wasp. They love that. Oh, they'll get on there and just start ripping into that flesh, because that's, that's what they're looking for. That's what they want, especially in the fall, uh, and they're getting ready to, to uh, hibernate for the winter. <laughs> but anyway, uh, there's nerve tissue in there, and when these these insects are attacking that tissue, it hurts, and they don't like that. <laughs> Bucks don't like that, and they don't think about it a whole bunch until they get back to the bedding area and they lay down there, and there they are, and here comes the flies swarming. Boy, they smell that rotting tissue, and it's all around their antlers buzzing and. And you can imagine how that sounds. And then having these insects starting to tear away at the sensitive tissue, not a happy time. And on top of that, at this very same time, uh, whitetails have bot larvae. They're little worms, <laughs> like you see from, you know, from maggots, you know, from these other flies. But little worms crawling around in their nasal passages back in the sinuses in their head. And they got a you know, long set of nasal passages. And I can imagine that wouldn't feel good <laughs> to have them crawling around in there. And this is when it's at its worst. You know, it's, these bot flies uh, and uh, whatever it is that, that gets in there and plants seeds in there and this, or eggs and the eggs hatch and these little worms are so there they are in their bedding area and Gene and I have watched bucks in bedding areas this time of year still in velvet 
getting close to the first of September, and they're sitting there, and they're not resting at all. They're just jerking their head this way and that way. <laughs> they're going every which way. Some of them, you know, they've been rubbing their nose so much with their hind hoof, scratching it because it itches, because all these worms in there be kind of red fur around their nose, you know, they injured it with their own hoofs, you know, and they sneeze maybe. And finally, you can just see it in their eyes. I've had it. <laughs> they jump up, run over to a little tree or a bush, or a woody bush, and start rubbing their antlers on there. Get this over with, you know. It's, it's, it, it, it's, it's, the tissue is sensitive, but they just can't stand it anymore. And they're rubbing, trying to get it all off as quickly as possible. And they like to use small trees like this because, you know, where the angles of the tines are, you know, where they come together, they want to be able to get in there and get all that tissue off every which way they can. And they'll work at it and work at it, and they just can't get it off. You'll see a picture here, you've seen it before, where a buck has been working on getting rid of the bell, and he still has tatters on there, bloody tatters on his antlers. And they'll run over to a, a deep grass or a, a leafy, a branch on a tree has just brushed your antlers from side to side in that in that foliage to try to wipe off the rest of that those tatters of of uh, velvet. But it, it, the way it works, it usually takes at least three days for them to get it all off. I'm gonna get it all off, get cleaned off. So no more flies and yellow jackets attacking their antlers and. And uh, they're even starting to find relief from those maggots in their, in their nasal cavities. Those maggots will come out and, I don't know, they drop on the ground burrow and they stay in there as pupils all winter and then they hatch in the spring and uh, start looking for deer again. So anyway, they like small tree trunks or, or bushes with smaller diameter woody branches to rub on because they want to get into those little angles between antlers. So you don't find big rubs on great big diameter trees at that time of the year, around the first of September. So those are velvet rubs. And their only purpose is to get rid of velvet. And uh, so they don't have much of a, of a function other than that. But that's the first ones you find. And, you know, you get out there in early October, and uh, and you're scouting again. Like if you're if you're going or a crazy Nordbergs, we get out there in early October quite often. And there's no other antler rubs in the woods at that time. The the, the really big uh, frenzy of making antler rubs is still a week or two ahead. Uh, that usually doesn't start until the latter half of October. So you look around there, you find antler rubs, but not very many of them. But one thing to keep in mind when you do find them, you're close to a buck bedding area, more than likely. You know, when they're, when they're growing velvet, bucks don't move around a lot. The big dominant breeding buck, or he, uh, you know, so for a rehunt, they can be 300 pound animals, very big things. Hardly move around the forest areas. Uh, during the summer while they're growing antlers and they like to bed where they're in or very near lots of good feed, you know, green grasses and green leaves of various kinds and not too far from water. Usually they like to bed within 100 yards of water. Well, we found a huge bed in deep grass. That's huge. That's a big animal. Right here, well, here's water right next to me. That's typical. They bed near water, not usually so close. Of course, the area here is full of food for him. That clear cut's got a lot of grass in it in the winter time. And he's got some quick, thick escape areas all around here to run into if a wolf comes along or a hunter wandering around aimlessly. So they ain't moving around a lot. And it's kind of out of the way. An old, well-formed deer trails going through their bedding areas. You just don't find them. That's why if you just stick to deer trails when you're out skying the woods, you don't find many buck bedding areas. The bedding areas are really big bucks. You have to get off trail. So that kind of, that kind of you know, discoveries of antler reps like this 
uh, er, you know, uh, in October, early part of October, or even, you know, if you're going to be bow hunting beginning the middle of September, you're out there early September, uh, you're going to find that's the only kind of antler rubs you're going to find. But they're important ones. It tells you where, but you know, you're close to a, where a, a big buck and a mature buck is bedding. Okay, so that's phase one of ant, what you need to know about antler rubs. Now let's get to phase two. Uh, you know, once bucks have shed velvet, all the bucks living in a square mile. Here's a, here's a diagram, kind of a rough diagram, of an actual uh, uh, home range of a, of a dominant breeding buck. You know, one of the big guys. Right? There's only one in, in a square mile. And this, ha this is pretty, most of a square mile here, this picture. And there's a beaver pond over here, and one side beaver dam there. And, and it, typically, within a dominant buck's home range, there will be other older bucks. Uh, you know, the dominant breeding buck, he's in his prime at age five and a half. Uh, they're still pretty big at six and a half, but in the wilds, usually their antlers aren't, the tines aren't quite as long, and the main, main beams aren't quite as long as they were when they were five and a half. And then, uh, so they're starting to go downhill after that. Now, between September 1st and the middle of October, all the bucks living in this area that have antlers, that includes yearling bucks, will meet in a favorite feeding area. So let's say this one here. And every day, twice a day, they'll get there in the morning and feed there in the morning, and then again in the evening. And uh, about the last hour of the day, and uh, oh, about 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, and during those, those particular hours, these bucks, all these bucks living here, I don't have uh, ranges of yearling bucks in this range, but in this square mile, there's four uh, ranges of does in here. And half of the Yufban's born each year are, are bucks. And if, so if you got four in here and our does only have one fawn a year, uh, there, there's only going to be two yearling bucks in that range. Well, let's, let's just imagine that's the way it is here. Down south you might have, all your does are having uh, twins, so you can have twice as many yearling bucks in the range in the fall as we have up north, in the north, far north, and especially where our deer numbers are low because of all the wolves we have. But anyway, so Bucks aren't so concerned about who lives in their ranges. They'll allow these lesser bucks that they've been beating up during this period. Uh, late in the feeding period, they battle to, to gain dominance, and the buck that ends up whipping all of the others it ends up being the dominant breeding buck for the year. Well, a lot of dominant breeding bucks will begin being dominant at age four and a half, and some even at three and a half. You know, they're big and tough and aggressive, they've got a nice rack on them, and they'll beat up all these other ones. Now, they can still live there, but they, they meet every day in a special feeding area to get this settled between them, and they might battle or spar many times during this uh, one month period from mid-September through mid-October, uh, getting this straightened out about who's most dominant and who's next the, the next one who beat up everybody except that one bigger buck or the one tougher buck and so forth and then down the bottom will be one of those yearling bucks maybe a spike <laughs> they didn't have much of a chance against these other deer so they've been battling during that month and a half actually from September 1st till mid-October now I'm going to talk to you more about this in a little bit but Things are changing now, but this is the way it was. When I was young, boy, I remember we couldn't wait for the first frost every year. We waited for that to go scouting. And generally here in Minnesota, our, up there, up north where we hunted, from the upper half of the state, the first frost would always occur about the 
around the 15th of October. It was every year, it was the same way. Sometimes it would, you know, it would be a little later and sometimes a little earlier. And sometimes when it was earlier, uh, there'd be frost one night and boy, that starts a frenzy of making antler rubs. Boy, they're all over the buck is out, those bucks out there rubbing on trees all over the place. And yearling bucks, oh, they don't make as many, but all the way up to the big dominant breeding buck, they're making antler rubs all over this woods here. And all the other bucks, you know, be in between. So, in their own ranges. Now, you see separate ranges. Here's one here for a lesser buck. And let's see, here's another one. Oh, this one here for another lesser buck. This is a pretty good size one. That may be, be a four and a half year old buck. Or could even be a six and a half, which just doesn't have quite the antlers of the big dominant breeding buck. This smaller one here is probably a three and a half year old, maybe two and a half year old. So, anyway, uh, but. They start making antler rubs, and where do they make them? Well, they make them alongside trails. Well, yearling bucks, yearling bucks spend their entire yearling year with their mothers, and they feed with them. And uh, so it's pretty common for yearling bucks to make antler rubs. Maybe oh, about a half dozen in the fall, and that's about it. And they'll make them wherever the mother feeds. Like, say, the mother feeds here. Well, that's where he'll make them out there. He'll get bored out there while mother's feeding, and once in a while he'll attack a tree and uh, and make an antler rub on a small diameter tree. Now, bigger bucks make antler rubs on bigger trees. But why is that? <laughs> well, here's a good reason. Uh, when when a buck makes a uh, starts rubbing our tree during this period at this time you know and mid by mid-october the testosterone levels which have been getting higher and higher and higher as we're closer to breeding have been getting higher and higher in their blood uh, welling in their bloodstreams and the more testosterone there is in their bloodstreams the more aggressive they become toward other deer uh, they they want to fight them. <laughs> and boy, they've been, by the mid-October, they're really going at it out there. You see here a lot of antlers clattering out there and bucks grunting while they're doing this. And so, but anyway, about we get that first sub-freezing temperature at night here in Minnesota, and if it stays that way, it'll go. They'll be making them for a week or more. Just And a lot of times they'll be re renewing them. They'll go work on it a little bit more, a second and even a third time later on. But why are they doing that? <laughs> well, well, I'll get to that in a minute, but when they make a rub like this, because that testosterone is getting up, and they're really getting to be combative, you know, and when they fight, they, they, they fight with their antlers engaged, pushing like crazy toward the, one another, and the buck that loses the battle is forced to get ground and jump away for, because he's getting hurt, here's a tine poking him in the side of the face or in the neck or something. That buck lost. And the other one is more dominant. And you know, he'll be more dominant to this other buck all the rest of the year until next year until they shed velvet. And then they'll go at it again next year. But anyway, so when they're when they're working on a tree at this time, they'll start to put some effort in there, like they're battling another buck, you know, with their antlers. They're battling a tree with their antlers. And that tree will be really wiggling around when they're doing this. Now, a two and a half year old buck or a yearling buck doesn't have much antler. Some, some of those farm bucks, you know, have, have as many as ten points, in the little basket type antlers. But and most of them, where we hunt, are are forkies, and so they don't have a lot of antler to work with, you know. And our yearling bucks weigh about 140, 150 pounds live. And so they're smaller deer. Our big dominant bucks will get up over 300 pounds. Not all of them, but some of them. And so there's quite a difference in their weight. So this 150 pound yearling buck with, with four antlers or maybe a spike, he's trying, he's pushing on this tree <laughs> uh, because he's fighting it. Now, 
When a buck fights a tree like that, he's the number one purpose is to get a lot of bark off the tree so it can be seen way over there. And we'll get to that. There's a reason for that. <laughs> That's why they make the antler rubs at this time. But anyway, they don't want to break the tree. <laughs> they'd, they'd lose the purpose of making it, you know, so they kind of have to hold back a little bit. But they want the tree to bend because it's giving ground. <laughs> you know, they're going to win the battle with the tree. And that probably bolsters their ego a little bit. They feel a little bit good about that. But they pick a tree that's appropriate to their weight and to their antlers. So, yearling bucks like little ones. Usually, they'll rub on trees, oh, inch, as much as an inch in diameter, three-quarter of an inch, something like that, the smaller one. When you find a fresh one, you know, in latter half of October, fresh creep that feels damp, that was made by yearling buck, and almost every time. And it's not uncommon at the base of the tree where he made the rub, there'll be a ground scrape about a foot diameter, not very big. You know, it'd be like that, there's a little ground scrape there, underneath there. And this is a yearling buck's first attempt at creating an antler up and a ground scrape. But that has a purpose. He maybe doesn't understand that yet, but it's in his genetics to do this. This is important to a buck. Every buck wants to eventually be the dominant breeding because buck because that's the buck that's going to do all the breeding in this queer mile. They all want to be that big buck that gets do all this breeding. Well, yearling bucks don't get much of a chance. Now, two and a half year old bucks, they're heavier deer. They can be up to 195 pounds in weight. That's quite a bit bigger deer. And then when they're working on that antler rub or on that tree, they want, you know, a little one inch tree, diameter tree isn't going to be much fun for them. They want some, they want to be able to put some pressure on there, you know, boy, I'm mad now, I'm getting madder and madder, I'm working on this tree. And he wants to push, and he wants to, to give, but they don't want it to break. So they like the bigger diameter trees, two and a half year old bucks. And so, quite, you know, when you find a single one like this out in the woods next to a trail, about this size, it was made by a two and a half year old buck. Almost every time. Something to know, huh? Okay. Now, bigger bucks, like, oh, you get to be three and a half. Now this is getting a little more serious. They want to have bigger diameter. A three and a half year old buck will probably go after a tree that's oh close to three inches in diameter. It bends, but it won't break, and so Pretty, it's pretty typical. I mean, it's, this is not 100% stuff, but most of the time, it's you're you're accurate when you decide. Oh, look at here, a three and a half year old buck here. Might have been bigger, but sometimes the buck he wants to make this antler rub in a certain spot. And we'll talk about that in a little bit because this is the best place to put one. This thing is this thing he just made, this antler rub, is going to do better here. It's going to function in a special way for him if it's here. And he looks around, there's nothing around here that big. Oh, here's one like this. I think I'll just do it on that one. That might be a five and a half, six and a half year old buck that made that. But most of the time, a two, two, two and a half inch diameter tree trunk is made, is made by a two and a half year old. And then when you get the bigger ones like this, that's a three and a half. Now that's a decent buck. Uh, three and a halfs can be uh, dominant breeding bucks. We found that true this last uh, firearm hunting season in uh, Minnesota, wolf country, where our deer numbers are way down. And surprisingly, there weren't enough bucks in the area that were uh, four and a half to six and a half to act as dominant breeding bucks. And we had a couple ranges where there the, the dominant breeding buck was actually a three and a half year old. And this is kind of what you find in along well used deer trails in that area. And that tells you, oh, here's a three and a half year old here. So that's kind of nice to know. 
Then you get to the big guys. You know, these bucks must have <laughs> kind of strange is walking along. I'm, I think I'll go over there and, and, and do some more work on this antler rub. And um, it comes over to this place and, well, where is it? I, what happened to my rub? It's not here anymore. We get, when you start getting rubs on trees this time, right, like up six inches, sometimes even bigger, But when you start seeing them on on, on diameter, uh, trees with diameters like this, that's a big buck. You this you get the guy that made that that rub, and you'll probably be taking his his uh, cape and antlers to a taxidermist at the end of the season. A big buck made that antler rub. That was a big one. There's a lot more to antler rubs than you might realize. You know. An antler rub isn't just something you see in the woods and they're easy to see way over there. And that's one of the reasons they're made because they can be seen way over there. Ground scrapes, you aren't, you aren't going to see the ground scrape until you're practically on top of it. But an antler rub, you can see way over there somewhere. And what bucks are doing when they're making these rubs, besides burying that wood so it'll be easy to spot great distances away, they're also spending time rubbing scalp musk on them. You know, up between the antlers up there, that usually darker, deeper fur up on the top of their head, it's got all kinds of little glands in the skin that produce a real pungent musk. And somehow it seems like, I don't know if it's because bucks who are destined to become downward breeding bucks do this and others don't and then because then they don't get to be dominant breeding bucks. But a lot of dominant breeding bucks will produce a whole lot of that musk from those glands on their scalp. And it doesn't come from their eyes, it comes from that up here. And it'll get when you get into this season, right about mid-October, that musk is really starting to pour out of those glands and it flows down it's kind of viscous like syrup and it gets down around the sides of their heads and down onto the sides of their neck and it dries there you know and they turn their head this way and that way and then it cracks for them and it increases in the in the fur of their neck and when you see a big buck in the woods and you say boy look at that, those vertical creases in his neck fur that's, a dumb, that's the biggest buck in the area you're hunting right now. The surrounding square mile. That's the big guy. Boy, you see those creases in the neck. And wetness on the side of their face. You know, the next time you get a buck, take a whiff of the scalp on that buck, you know, when they're well, you, after you get them home, if you're going to have them butcher some, take a whiff of that. You'll smell that. It's different kind of musk. It's got a sharper odor. It's not as prevalent as musk coming from the tarsal glands inside the legs, their hind legs of a buck. They get a lot more stink out of those <laughs> in, in another way. But they put this odor on the rub it the sides of their heads onto that that antler rub after they create it and then rub it all over the place and that way and i've watched bucks do this i've watched them lick it seems like they lick it to decide oh i think that's enough or oh i better put a little more on there and rub some more on that so it's not just something you see it's the odors that they're laying on here now why are they doing it they all want to be breeding bucks and the way, they become, the way they become a breeding buck is to establish a breeding range. They, they want, and they'll mark it. You know how dogs will mark their own yard, and wolves do that, and bears do that, and all kinds of creatures, mammals in particular, uh, hoofed or pod, it doesn't matter, will mark their ranges with urine to tell other animals in the area a, this range or belong to this big animal. A lion, <laughs> in the case of a lion, this is, or a wolf, a wolf too, a wolf pack, this is 
you better, if you're not a member of that wolf pack, or if you're not one of the alpha male or females that live on this area in the summertime, you're in deep trouble because if they catch you on their range, they're going to kill you. They're going to try. This is a dangerous country to be in. Right? They mark them. Now, yearling or, or does are like that. Boy, they mark theirs with, they don't have much to mark their range, their home ranges, but they mark them with urine. And every doe uh, apparently has a different odor that's recognized by all the other does in the area, different smelling urine. They recognize each other by the smell of their urine. Like fingerprints almost. For the deer on the woods. Well, that's that dog. Oh, that's another one. That's its fawn or whatever, you see. But does don't want other does with fawns living in their ranges. Their ranges are relatively small. They go, they might be 90 to 200 acres, maybe even bigger if there's not many deer there. But uh, they average about 125 acres. And 125 acres is not big enough to feed two does with young you know, including their yearlings. So they, if another doe with young wanders into another doe's home range, boy, there's going to be a fight. That home range doe, she's going to be as tough as uh, the dog that lives in your yard. He's pretty tough about other dogs coming in his yard. So they chase them away. Big bucks aren't so concerned about that. Those older bucks, they won't let all the bucks live in their range, but they'll allow a few of them. And then the yearlings, of course, they live there as well. So, anyway, but they go about marking their breeding ranges with antler rubs that are laced with scalp musk. And let's take a look at this diagram. Let's go back to this range here. Now, these dotted lines are, are major deer trails in this home range. And, uh, there's some parts that they hardly ever go through. Uh, but other parts, they, they spend a lot of time on, on all these trails. And almost all, of the, almost all of these trails are made by does and they're young. They're doe trails. You know, if you go outside of that, the boundaries of this buck's home range, that's this total area, about a square mile in size, you don't see many trails. Maybe one here. Here, you see, here, there, there, there. But when you're in a doe range, there's trails all over the place. These are main trails. I mean, there, it'd be just laced with trails in between made by does with the young. Now, does are rarely alone. They're not lone animals. They have young, they have fawns, and they have yearlings trailing them. And so, they're small herds. And wherever they walk a lot, they create a very definite trail in the woods. And it's more than just a trail, it's a, it's a tunnel through cover. Their bodies pushing aside branches and grasses, and their sharp hoofs are, are killing grasses on the ground. They're chewing up the ground, the sharp edge hoofs, making definite trails. And some of these trails are more important than others, and the ones that they use a lot become really definite. You know, the average guy walks out there in the woods, oh, that must be a deer trail, because boy, you can see this trail going through the woods. That's, that's a deer trail. It might be a buck trail while breeding is in progress. It might even be a buck trail during this, the two to three weeks, maybe the last half of October, it might be a buck trail. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, this is the, the dominant breeding buck bedding area in this home ranch, right here. It's on top of a little hill. It's a lot of grass and a lot of trees and brush up there. It's on top of that hill. He can watch anybody going by down here along this creek here. Yeah, wolves travel along that trail quite a bit, and he can watch them go by. <laughs> but anyway, and, and hunters, anyway, he likes to bed there. And uh, there, there's one trail going up there, another one out of there, but when you get over here, there's hardly a deer trail. You don't notice anything that is, looks like a deer trail. The big bucks use doe trails to get around. A lot of times the doe trails aren't big enough 
you know, not, not a tall enough and wide enough tunnel through cover for a buck with great big antlers. And he's forced to walk off trail. And it's not uncommon where we hunt for big bucks to walk off trail up to 50% of the time in November just because of that. Because those darn doe trails aren't big enough tunnels to cover for them, especially if they have big antlers. So, if you were a big buck and you wanted to mark off an area you thought you should be your breeding range, where would you put your antler, uh, antler rumps? You put them on main deer trails, major deer trails, on trees alongside major deer trails. That's where you'd put them. Because those are the trails that are most likely to be used by bucks, other bucks in there. You want those other bucks to say, oh, this guy has got these trees marked so that he thinks this is going to be his breeding range. And so, yearling bucks, they don't do a lot of it. They'll, do, like I said, they'll maybe make a few where, they, where their mothers feed, you know, you'll find a few of them there, little ones, with maybe a little ground scrape down below in front of it. But these other bucks, older bucks, they'll make them along major deer trails. Oh, the area, this guy here, he'd have around here in, in this area, he'd say, that's my breeding range. Bucks generally, they want their breeding range to be the range that they've been living in all summer. They know that really well, and there's maybe a door or two, and they're young living in that side of that range. So that's they'll settle for that. But they mark them the major deer trails within it. And this guy here, he'll be putting them in major deer trails in this area. They're all major deer trails made by doe. They're young, so that's where they go. Well, the big guy here is. He's got this whole mile. He's going to put antler rubs all over the place. Not only there, but inside, everywhere here. And he wants he wants those trees, those antler rubs, to be seen almost everywhere a buck is liable to travel. A different buck. Any buck with antler is liable to travel. He's going to see that antler rub. And then when he starts getting close to it, he's going to smell that scalp musk. And the biggest buck in the area, has scalp musk that is powerful. <laughs> I mean, when a like say a light wind is blowing like today. Okay, uh, kind of apologize a little bit here. We got a little breeze today, and we got people mowing and buses going by, and that's part of living here in the suburbs. <laughs> and uh, well, we thought we'd give it a try. And this is one of our this is our first chance <laughs> in a while now, a couple weeks, three weeks to uh, create a YouTube uh, presentation, so we're taking it. And uh, what we m might end up with is four of them here. We'll see how it goes. Okay, let's get back to this now. Now, we're talking about the big buck, the big dominant breeding buck. Um, he, 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 know, he wants his breeding range to be this entire square mile. No messing around, boy. These other guys are not going to be able to live here. Yeah. Well, breeding's going on, so they're just wasting their time making ant uh, antler rubs at this point. But this big guy, he'll make, I've known some dominant breeding bucks that make uh, up to 30 antler rubs within his square mile feeding, uh, home range along major deer trails. And he's especially going to be careful to put them along edges where there's a major trail. And where trails come in, you know, like here, there's going to be one there, one there, uh, one there. Sometimes they use the same tree several times, several years in a row, but certain spots along these trails where they intersect uh, strategic sites all around this thing, where some buck goes down to get water here, you know, he wants one right there. He wants them in places that are sure to be discovered by other bucks in the area and he wants them and he, he knows that these other bucks are going to know those are his antler rubs because boy they got a good strong whiff of that scalp musk on them besides being readily seen great distances away. So uh, that's what he's up to. Now think about this you know and a day like you know we got light breeze going through it 
scalp musk were always up to 30 antlers flowing downwind. Next day, the wind's blowing this way, going this way. That whole square mile is being infused with that big buck's scalp musk. Now, like a lot of odors, that scalp musk doesn't last forever. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like syrupy uh, material, uh, uh, liquid when it when it's rubbed on the tree, and it'll dry on there. It'll last for a while. I, I don't have any idea how long it'll last, but I do know that during this two week, two to three week period before breeding begins, the big dominant buck, especially, thinks it's really important to re keep renewing that scalp musk on a, on a lot, if not all, of his antlerubs. Mm. Got to have keep that scalp musk strong there, so that when some buck comes walking in here and he smells that there, oh, that sounds that smells like it was just made today. That big guy is probably around here somewhere. Now we got a blower going <laughs> in the neighbor's yard. Okay, so here in Minnesota, the, the temperature that triggers all this frenzy of activity, of establishing breeding ranges of, of, of antlered bucks, happens when the temperature gets down below freezing at night. Now. There have been years when it was really warm, you know, in October. Well, it was up to the 70s and 80s, right up until the beginning of November. You won't see many antelopes being made. You know, you might think, oh, this doesn't take much to make an antelope, but that takes a lot of work there. And putting that effort in there and that bucket really pushing hard on that tree and bending it, you know, that's hard work. Now, by mid-October, all the bucks in our area have their winter fur. And this is no <laughs> light fur. You know, we have long periods of 30 to 45 degree below temperatures up there where we hunt in the winter time. And our deer have to survive them. So their fur is especially heavy then. And you get a 70, 80 degree day, they're not going to be one bit interested in making antelope. So that's a lot of work. They're too uncomfortable when they have their winter fur. Temperatures like that, they're more likely to just find a shady place under a big evergreen like this balsam behind me uh, and stay there all day and not move from there until it's cool in the evening. And up in the morning, they'll feed a little bit past sunrise in the morning before it gets hot again. And that'll be the best times to see them, of course. But they aren't going to make a lot of antler rubs you know, when you have a warm October and even a, a few first few days of November. You aren't going to see a lot of big antler rubs like this along those major deer trails, single antler rubs. Not many. So keep that in mind. But anyway, this big buck, that's, he's got this is breeding range, all marked now with antelopes that smell strongly of scalp musk. And he wants that musk to be strong now for the next two weeks because he's going to empty this area out of these other bucks. They're going to have to go live somewhere else temporarily. So from this point on, he's going to be looking for these other bucks. And every time he finds one, you know, he's beat them up. He's the big master buck, the boss buck of this square mile. So when he sees them coming with red in his eyes, like, boy, you're in trouble, he's got his head down, he's going to attack them, they're going to go. Boy, they'll run off range, and they'll spend time hiding in little areas, like buck bedrooms, off range somewhere, it's out of the area. Now, the older bucks, they've been through this before, so they know the program. You know? Well, some of them won't bother to try to come back and tell there's no more aroma of doe and estrus pheromone in the air. They'll stay off. They know it's dangerous to go there. Some of the younger ones, maybe two and a half year old, three and a half year old, or might try to sneak back. They smell pheromone drifting in the breeze coming off that, that, that range, and they'll go over there and all excited. And boy, then they kind of lose their mind. 
and they smell that, and they'll go to where the doe is. And of course, at that point, when when that starts happening, you know, that's when breeding begins. Yeah, breeding begins third of November where we hunt. Uh, that biggest buck is going to be with that doe, and here comes one of these other bucks. That buck is in trouble. You know. Now. Before I explain what happens then, you know, in breeding, I've got to go back one step a little bit. You know, between September and and uh, the last half of, uh, of, of October, uh, bucks might feed together every day, most of them, at one place or another, but they split up after feeding and battling <laughs> and go back to their own bedding areas. And while they're in their bedding areas, now we get later in the month, and like they're saying, the testosterone is building up in their bloodstreams, and they're getting restless. And especially that big dominant breeding buck. Oh man, he's he's got a lot on his mind. He's got to get rid of all these other bucks, and he's got to maintain all these antler rubs all around his breeding range and across the middle of it, different places, maybe up to 30 antler rubs. And uh, and he's getting to the point where I can't stand to have any more bucks in this place, and he'll be really restless. He won't rest much in his bedding area. And because of that, every now and then, he'll just decide, I'm going to make another antler rub to get rid of that charged up energy he has in his body. And he'll work on that, and uh, maybe two, three, and that's typical for older bucks. Uh, at this time of the year, they'll they'll be restless and they'll make a number of antler rubs in their bedding area, and usually at least six. But I've seen at least thirty in some buck bedding areas, dominant buck bedding areas. Even the younger bucks will make some. You'll see them. You might find some where they're like this. Now. Within that big buck's bedding area, there might not be a lot of ideal trees to make antler rubs on. So he might make some on this size. And not much smaller than that, but he'll, he'll make some on smaller trees as well. But it's the biggest ones in that buck bedding area that tell you the story about how big that buck is. So keep that in mind. But when we're scouting, and we like to get off trail a lot, because like I say, you don't find buck bedding areas when you just follow major deer trails. It's pretty rare. When you're off trail, you're, you'll, you'll be out there in the woods and you're scouting, and you see an antler up over there. Oh yeah, there's one over there. And gee, it looks pretty big. <laughs> Let's go over there. Maybe it's a bedding area. Oh, there's another one. Now it's getting a little more exciting. You know, that one's only about 10 feet away from the other. There's a third one. Yep, that's a bedding area. Now, I used to hunt buck bedding areas a lot. And I learned the hard way some facts about buck bedding areas. Uh, if a buck catches you in a tree or on the ground, stand on him, close to his bedding area, he won't come back. Uh, uh, and you can't get close to one without a buck knowing it. It's really hard because they deliberately follow a trail setting traps for sound and sight and odor. Uh, three different ways of detecting your approach if you're following their tracks. And boy, when they catch you there, when they're, you're close enough so that they uh, identify you because you made s certain sounds breaking through all this brush that he jumped over, <laughs> uh, that he had to go through. You're breaking through that brush, cracking noises, you know, branches breaking, or uh, you cross little openings, the buck crossed it well before he got to his bedding area, and he said, oh, there you are, he sees you coming. It's that sort of thing. <clears throat> And his trail will lead you in a little circle until you're upwind of where he's laying down. And then he's got you again. Anytime that happens, 
that buck is going to disappear probably without you even realizing it. He probably will sneak out of there without making any noise and he won't be back for the season. You won't see that thing all hunting season because he's going to, he's going to abandon his range. You know, that's his most secure area. All summer long he's been secure there. The wolves never found him. Uh, never had any problem. Bears, never, no problem at all. And when somebody, a hunter, comes wandering around <laughs> and gets into that bedding area, and or let's say he's gone and he comes back to it and he finds a fresh trail scent there in his bedding area, that same, same problem happens. He's going to abandon his entire breeding range not just going to go bed somewhere else. He's going to, maybe he'll go live off range a little ways and maybe he'll move around a little bit, you know, depending on the wind direction so all the does living in this area know where he is because, you know, he'll be stinking. Boy, he's going to have a lot of tarsal musk coming out of his tarsal glands and he's got scalp musk. He's going to be stinking and then the wind blows. It, it'll cover, it, those does on the other opposite end of that square mile area will smell him. Oh, he's up there. They'll go to the buck to be bred. You know, they only got 24 to 26 hours uh, to breed once they, 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 once they're, um, uh, they start releasing the pheromone that says they're going to breed. It, it goes real quickly, so they don't wait around. You know, like a lot of people believe they do. They don't wait around. At this time, they can cross home ranges of other does and the does won't bother them. They understand at this time. It seems to be a truce while breeding is going on. So the does can cross to get to where that buck is. They can smell him. He's up there. Go right to the buck to be bred. Stay with him for 24 hours and then come back home again. So, But anyway, when we're scouting, we're always looking for antler rubs. And when we find clusters of them out there in the woods, out of the way place, we know we found a buck bedding area. So we've learned over the years that you're going to see a lot more bucks, have a lot more chance to take big bucks when you stay away from bedding areas. Now, I succeeded in getting them, you know, years ago, but it wasn't an annually successful thing to do. I mean, now and then, maybe one big one every three years, something like that before I finally succeed. I can succeed every year. I can get a decent buck every year if I stay away from buck bedding. So it's good to know where they are. And the first thing that tells you is, there's an antler up and there's another one and there's another one. And you've got one, you don't have to get any close. Stay out of there. Don't mess around. Get out of there. Mark it on your map like we do. So you don't ever bother that buck during the hunting season when it's bedding there. No. Sounds crazy, but your chances of taking that buck will be ever so much better if you don't mess around that bedding area during the hunting season. Stay 200 yards away from it, if you can. So, there. Now, there's another <laughs> phase of antler rubs. You know, older bucks will sometimes make antler rubs as late as uh, December. I've seen them the day before uh, New Year's making an antler rub. I've seen one do that and I found others that were fresh. You know, here they are in the snow and there's all these little little fragments of bark laying there in the snow and the snow just was fell a day or so ahead of time and gee, this is pretty fresh. It was made by a buck now. Um, so uh, that, that happens but most of the time, especially once breeding begins, they don't have time anymore to be maintaining antler rubs and ground scrapes. They're going to be searching for does, keeping their eyes peeled for bucks that dare, dare to sneak back, and they're going to be accompanying does in estrus, for, and each one of them 24 to 26 hours. And a lot of times, another doe will go in estrus uh, you know, during that period, and it'll come to the buck, and he'll have two of them along with their fawns and yearlings, except yearling bucks, yeah, with them. So you got a little harem going there. So he's going to be pretty busy, and so he doesn't have time to be renewing antler, and for that matter, ground scrapes as well. But it does happen. Now, 
let's say now breeding started here it's the third of November and in this square mile it almost always happens on the third of November on this square mile you know it, it be, for some reason there's a door there that starts that goes in the estrus until the fifth and over here nothing there either until the seventh you know there's a two-week period of breeding and each doe is only in estrus for 24 to 26 hours by then. They're spread out during that two week period, so it lasts two weeks. Well, anyway, uh, so anyway, when he, let's say, finally, here's a doe in estrus here. And there's this buck that lived in this range. He's hiding out over here on this little island there, surrounded by a bog or a swamp, maybe, or something like that. Nice little safe place. And, uh, so he's sitting in there, and gee, the wind is blowing toward him, and oh man, I gotta go over there. <laughs> he gets over there, and next thing you know, he's he's come upon the big buck and the doe in estrus. And that big buck, when he sees that that other buck, he is furious. Not only furious, but he's extremely dangerous at this point in. Of time, a big dominant buck can be, will can kill other deer, other bucks, and I've I've um, I've found places where that's happened. I've had it. I didn't see it happen. I seen one severely injure another buck, and he was in pretty poor shape after that battle, uh, trying to get him away from this doe in, in heat. Sometimes it happens between two big dominant bucks, you know, another dominant buck in the neighborhood. Right on the edge there, and they'll fight over who's going to breed that doe. And those are the bucks that are liable to get their antlers stuck together and maybe die because of that, you know. So, but anyway, at this point, a big buck is going to be furious. There's that buck, and he feels kind of a little bit helpless because he doesn't want to leave this doe in heat that he's with. And he doesn't want to go running off, and maybe if there's another one run off, running around there, it might run in and, and breathe the door while he's chasing the other one away. What that big will probably do instead is put on a show you know, to, to tell that other buck, you better get out of here, this is what's going to happen to you. And he'll go over and there'll be a little tree like this sitting there, and he'll proceed to just murder it. He'll bust it up. Maybe it's a, 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 a little clump a bunch of bunch of little things like that and just break them all up they'll be all shattered all over the place like that maybe it'll be in one of his antler rubs right there in, in, close by he'll go over there quickly renew the rub put fresh musk on then the branch overhanging his scrape he'll, he'll, he'll get a scrape all renewed stinking real good in it with tarsal musk and then branch over that he'll go up there and he'll murder that overhanging branch it'll be shattered there'll be pieces hanging there bark off that kind of thing he's he's showing that buck what's going to happen that intruder what's going to happen if he doesn't get out of here if that thing makes a fool of itself it comes real close it will charge that buck but he probably won't chase it more than about 50 yards or so because he doesn't want to leave this doe alone so but anyway, he'll, that's when the big bucks will bust up branches, uh, bust up trees, uh, uh, they'll ravage little bushes, ravage branches over having the, overhanging their ground scrapes. When you see that, where you see that, that's a really recent thing, you know, in November. You know, they're not doing this anymore. They're, the, the does are breeding the big bucks with the doe, but what he's trying to, he's trying to, uh, make it plain to any intruding buck that's hanging nearby what's going to happen to him if he doesn't get out of here. So that's when they bust up things like that. Now, if you find a place where it's just happened, or a place where they've been battling and just happening, uh, where you know where you find uh, a, a ravaged bush or a young tree all busted up like that, uh, or just a branch overhanging a brown scrape all busted up like that and it's fresh, it wasn't here this morning and here you're back here at noon and oh look at what's happened here. That buck and doe are really close. 
they're close. They're probably listening and they're trying to figure out what you're doing. That maybe they know you're a, they've known from experience, you're a stand hunter, which nothing much to worry about. Once you stop walking, you don't move anymore all the rest of the day. All morning, all, all afternoon, you just sit there. You don't move. They don't worry much about stand hunters, except they'll keep a safe distance away once they've discovered you there. So, but anyway, uh, but they're close. So you get back to stand hunting. Now, I've been, so many times when I've been going to some other stand site in the woods early in the morning, and I've come across fresh tracks of a big buck and a doe, uh, few times where they've been fighting by where a freshly ravaged bush just all smashed up <laughs> or or branches like that and a freshly renewed ground scrape especially a fresh you, they don't renew many ground scrapes while, bre while breeding's in progress because they don't have time for that but when you find one it almost always means that buck is with a doe and heat, and there's another buck hanging around, and that's why he did that, and that's why those branches over that thing are broken there like that. And whenever I find one boy, I don't, I don't walk up to it and look at it, and you know, it's over there maybe 20 yards away, and I see that, and I say, oh geez, I, I don't want to screw that up and get my trail sent around that thing. So I'll back off right away and find a place to sit down on my stool within easy shooting distance and where I'm well concealed by natural foliage and it's wait, like I said in the beginning. Sometimes I only have to wait about 15 minutes and sometimes it'll be 15 minutes and there he is, he's rubbing scalp musk on that branch overhanging that ground scrap, that big buck. <laughs> sometimes that happens and that's exciting. That's some of, one of, the, some of the most fun hunts I've ever had in my life when that happens. But anyway, so now there's three phases of antler ups and they all mean something and it's good to know what they mean and and now you kind of know what to do about it. Now you know bow hunters like to hunt ground scrapes and rightfully so you know in the last half of November. Ground scrapes are being made at the same time for the same reasons as antler rubs. We'll get back to those in a, in a, a fairly soon here, but uh, but they're made that way for the same reasons. Uh, they're to tell other bucks uh, this is a breeding area, a breeding area of, of, a, of a buck, and it's telling the other bucks stay away. This is mine. This is a no trespassing sign. And uh, ground scrape has a lot of odor, a lot much more than an antler rub actually. And, but we'll get to that in a little bit. But this is the first half, you know, breeding range establishment uh, 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 phase, which begins in the latter half of October, if it isn't too warm. Uh, this is when all this stuff happens, and this is what all these signs mean. And you're going to see pictures here as, as you go through this section here. Uh, with that, just in case this is the end of one of these, or maybe two of them, let me say this. Um, thanks a lot for watching, guys, and take care now. This, don't mess around with this, this uh, coronavirus thing. Uh, people are getting too lax, kind of foolish people that are demanding that uh, we got to quit having to stay home, <laughs> quit having to walk six feet apart and things like that. That's so silly. Uh, we're just getting started. Uh, here it is, what is it, the 4th fourth, fourth of May? We're just getting started with this coronavirus outbreak. Thousands of people are going to die, yet, and if you're not careful, you're going to be one of them. It's so dumb, you don't have to do that. Uh, just get used to it. <laughs> be very careful. Wear a mask, wash your hands. Uh, a lot, but anyway, I, well, the thing is, be be careful, guys. I want you to come. And, I want you to have great deer hunting this fall and next fall, and uh, and that's you know that's my goal. I want to make you all better, more successful hunters. So uh, take care, will you? And uh, thanks for watching.
and, and be sure, you know, if you get a chance, to, uh, buy your book, <laughs> get your 10th edition, because you know you're going to have to, sometime or another, you're going to have this book. <laughs> And if you're going to be a, the, the hunter you want to be, because everything you need to know for using six, seven different ways of stand hunting that are going to enable you to be an annually, annually successful buck hunter in that book, you won't find that anywhere else in the world. This is it, right here. That's the only place in that book. So, well, anyway, now, before you check off here, be sure you, be sure you subscribe to my, my YouTube channel. Yeah. That's easy. There's a subscribe button down below here. Give it a poke and it just takes a minute. And then also, give me a poke the thumbs up uh, button as well. Uh, that's just as important to me to, to, con to be able to continue to bring you these seminars. And with that, thanks again, guys, and we'll see you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my eBooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.